Hi everyone. Uh, it's nice to meet you. Welcome all for today's session on uh, programming the cloud through APIs. My name is Noan Das, and um, I'm the Vice President and Deputy CTO for the uh, API Management and Integration Space at WSO2. Uh, let's uh, get started. Uh, let me start by uh, sharing my screen. Right. I hope all of you can see my screen okay. So today we are going to be talking about uh, what it means to program the cloud through APIs. So as I mentioned, this is me. You can catch me uh, on my uh, Twitter handle or, or my LinkedIn handle that's in there. Uh, I'm also the uh, co-author of, of the book that was released sometime last year called Microservices Security in Action. And um, I'm the deputy CTO and VP at WSO2 for API management and integration. So we are going to be talking about what it means to program the cloud through APIs. And what we are going to be going through today is uh, we are going to walk through the evolution of cloud you know, to study how it grows uh, and so on. And then we are going to look at uh, how APIs are going to be playing a critical role for, our, for businesses that are starting newly and also for existing businesses as well. And then we are going to be looking at how, um, uh, how what it means to develop an API in the cloud and what it means to utilize APIs in the cloud for developing an API as well. We are going to go through step by step, looking at each of the um, items required to develop an API successfully. And finally, uh, we'll be going through a demo of uh, a product we've launched where which is basically a platform which helps developers to create APIs on the cloud. So let's get started. So this is basically a graph that is showing the growth of the cloud software market. So this, is, this research has been done by Bessemer Venture Partners uh, analysis. So as you can see here, it is basically showing uh, the, the, the growth of the cloud market in the past uh, two decades. And it also gives a prediction uh, for the next 10 years as well. So as you can see here, back in, back in 2000, it was entirely software that was consuming the IT market. And around 2004, as you can see around here, cloud started to build up and it uh, grew gradually. And we are right about here at the moment. So just uh, about the 40% mark and uh, they, predict that in about the next four to five years, cloud would have uh, would be the majority uh, in the IT market. We, what that basically means is they would have passed the 50% mark of uh, IT. And they also do predict that by uh, 2032, basically in about 10 years from now, cloud would have consumed most of the uh, IT market, which is an interesting fact. Right, but guess what? They've also done some researches uh, back, back in 2015 and two of their biggest predictions failed uh, in a good way though. So one of the predictions they made in, back in 2015 was that uh, the cloud market would reach the $500 billion mark in around the year 2000. But guess what happened? it reached that mark or milestone two years earlier than predicted back in 2018. Similarly, they made an assumption or, or a prediction that the cloud would reach uh, a tr the trillion dollar mark uh, in another two to three years time. But guess what happened? Since they made that prediction back in 2019, in February, just uh, one year after that, the cloud hit the, the trillion dollar mark. So, as, as the point here is that the cloud seems to be growing at an exponential pace, right? Um, and it is basically consuming all of, all of software that we are going to be using in the future. Um, they've also made some predictions about uh, certain aspects uh, in, in the IT field. And one of them being that APIs will drive innovation across all kinds of industries, which I think is true. So as you can see here, we all, we have APIs today for almost doing anything. So what you see here on the, on your screen, 
is basically a categorization of different API providers in the different industries. So there's Twilio for communication, there's Stripe for payments, Plaid for banking, and you know tons and tons of uh, API providers like these who operate in uh, different uh, kinds of industries. So that is a great thing for the API industry, of course. And what, what does this enable? So what this fundamentally enables is that with, with the APIs, the time to market for new businesses and even the time to market for new initiatives of current mature businesses goes down significantly. You can go to the market very quickly with, because of all these utility, utility APIs that you have uh, out there in the market today. So let's take a quick example to see what that means. Right? So imagine setting up a, a greeting card business today right and compared to setting it up back in back in 2000 two, two decades before right so so there's this you may some of you may have heard about this um, service called postable so they are an online to offline greeting card sending service uh, so imagine setting up that business 20 years before right so what would have you would have had to do right you would have first needed to rent a garage you know some space to keep your computers in and, and work. You, of course, have to buy computers. You'd have to set up networking, internet, and all of that, right? You will have to figure out some way of getting online payments, maybe bank transactions and scan receipts um, and so on, right? You'll have to write the greeting card generation software anyways. And uh, once that part is done, you'll have to hire people for the printing and mailing side of the business. Right, so that was 20 years ago. Now compare that situation to what uh, what we the, the situation we are in today. Right, so so today if you are basically setting this up, you probably just need a laptop, so you don't really need a big big space to keep your computer. So you probably work from home, right? And so you can basically rent computing from any IAS provider, right? You can choose AWS, Azure, Google, whatever that is, right? you don't really have to buy computers, right? And you can simply sign up to Stripe for getting online payments, right? You still have to write the greeting card generation software. So that situation hasn't changed, although how you do it would have changed a lot, right? And then for, for the printing and posting or mailing side of the business, you have Lob, yeah, they provide a service which allows you to, uh, you know, get your cards printed and posted and so on, right? So the, the situation today here, today is that we are facing is that we can really utilize all the services and APIs available that are provided by third parties. And we can really focus on the main part of our business, which is basically about writing the software that generates these postcards, right? Which is essentially uh, the uniqueness of the business, the unique value that this uh, business offered. And everything else can be obtained in a matter of hours, right? Because of these services. So as you can imagine, the, the time to market has gone down significantly because of all of these services available. Now, today we are going to be focusing on uh, the highlighted part in this slide, where, which is about writing the greeting card generation software. Right? How would you have? How would you do it today compared to two years before that? Right. So let's let's dive in. So effectively, any kind of software that we are going to build today is going to integrate with one or more APIs. Right. So if you are going to utilize Stripe for making payments, your software needs to integrate with Stripe. If you are going to utilize DocuSign or, or Lob or anything, any other service like that, your software needs to integrate with all of that it may need to integrate with salesforce accounting systems and all of that right so any software that you're going to build today will integrate with one or more apis that's almost a hundred percent guarantee in today's world right and what does it mean to integrate with apis at a very high level integrating with an api means fundamentally connecting to the api and then programming with the api right so there's not much you can do just by connecting to the API, right? Unless you can program against it, right? So uh, <clears throat> that's at a very high level what it means to integrate with an API and we'll get into the details of that, right? Um, 
and getting an api to work you know has has a typical life cycle that we are quite familiar with in in the software industry so you need to develop the api you need to write the code you need to test it you need to get it into production and once it's in production to offer this uh, api to consumers you need to be worried about uh, getting the exposure uh, of the service done properly <clears throat> right uh, and once it's running you need to be observing the api for for troubleshooting cases and and just to make sure that your api is running fine uh, you also need to be observing insights to plan and future work roadmap items you know to make business decisions and so on so that's basically what it takes to get an api up and running and today we are going to be looking at how you can get through uh, all of that processes uh, pretty quickly right so let's look into each of these things individually and see what it means uh, to get these things done. So what does it mean to develop an API? And we are, when you're talking about these aspects, we are going to be focusing on the items that are important in the context of this conversation, right? So as you all know, you need to basically write some code that has some business logic for developing the, uh, developing your value proposition, right? Um, and then when it comes to connecting to other APIs in the system, what's uh, important is, first of all, you need to be able to discover those APIs, right? Um, and they can be APIs that your organization loves to use. They may have to be purchased and so on. So, uh, however, at the end of the day, you need to be able to discover the APIs that you're permitted to use. And then you need to be able to connect to it, which means you need to have an addressable URL. You need to be able to uh, pass the right security credentials to those and not just about passing them. You need to store the credentials securely. You need to propagate those credentials securely across environments like from dev to stage to production and so on right uh, <clears throat> and then you need to be able to learn how to use those api which is where documentation comes into the picture right you need to quick the developers need to be able to quickly read through the documentation understand it and program against them quickly right so programming against those apis quickly also involves things like data manipulation where you have to read some data extract some a part of it out you know, mix it with something else and so on. It may require transformation uh, and a lot of things that you do with the data that is uh, passed and returned from an API. So that's basically the de development part of it in very brief, right? And once the development is done, the next step is to go and test your API, which involves first trying it out just to make sure that its functionality is working fine, right? And then implementing unit tests so that you test all of the uh, individual functions of the API properly, and then writing integration tests just to make sure that what, whatever new changes you introduce to the API doesn't break anything else and so on, right? So the testing aspect of an API um, is also very important. And once your tests are done, the next step is to get it into production. Now, this is a big deal. Getting an API into production is a big deal, right? It involves a lot of complicated processes like JITOPS, CICD pipelines, uh, proper DevOps practices, including securely storing and securely passing um, credentials, store, storing them appropriately, right? It, it also involves things like deployment strategies. So when you're doing continuous releases into production of the API, you need to be worried about what happens to my live traffic that's going on, right? How do I make sure that it doesn't, the new changes that I introduced doesn't break the existing traffic for the consumers, which is where you need to apply deployment strategies like blue, green, canary or whatever, right? Your deployment also needs to be reliable. So this is again a very important aspect. So it needs to be able to uh, scale on demand, right? So uh, scaling too much and too less is both a problem, right? If you scale too much, you basically waste a lot of money. If you scale too less, then you're going to be losing traffic because your customers are not going to be having a good experience, right? And if something goes wrong in the middle of the night, you need systems to basically come up and restore it as fast as possible um, uh, to its previous state, right? So, so there's a lot of things involved in getting an API into production and we all know it's not a simple task uh, even for a very simple API, right? So once it's in production, now, to expose your service as a business to consumers, it requires a series of things, including the governance aspects of this API, lifecycle management, 
attaching the proper documentation so that people can use it, right? And, and in cases where you monetize this API uh, as an additional source of revenue, you need to be worried about usage plans and so on, right? Security is also uh, a very important factor to consider when exposing your APIs for consu consuming consumption. So you need to think about logging, logging in, access control, rate limits, and all of that when exposing an API, right? And then these APIs are usually consumed through what we call as developer portals. So developers should have a place where they can come in, uh, find the API, and uh, go through the documentation, use it successfully. Uh, <clears throat> And you need to be observing the API once it's in production. So you need to know as fast as possible. If something is going wrong, you need to know how your API is behaving. So one aspect that's critically important in observing an API in this context is that it's not just sufficient to observe your own API only, right? Because as I mentioned in the beginning, your API is going to be dependent on several other APIs for functionality. So when your API is not doing so well, right? Knowing, just knowing that it's not doing so well doesn't help you much in terms of identifying the issue and addressing uh, and fixing it quickly, right? So you need, to, you need to have an overall observability system. You need to know how each of the dependent APIs are behaving in this context to have a successfully uh, running API, right? Then we have the regular observability that we do, which includes things like resource monitoring, logs, and so on, right? Uh, and and finally, APIs as you as you could have as you have imagined now are the entry point into your business. So once you have an API and you expose its functionality, that is basically the entry point uh, into your business. So this is the best place for obtaining various kinds of insight in how successful your business is running. Right. So by observing how your APIs are performing and what kind of data they are being. Uh, processing and so on, there are lots of insights you can get into your business, right? Like you can get a projection of your business growth based on how many users are signing up to use the APIs and so on, right? You can estimate like the happiness of your customers by looking at how many errors your APIs have been throwing, right? How many people have left off or unsubscribed from the API or no longer using it, right? You can estimate churn rates through that and a lot of things. So these insights are also important for the lifecycle management of the API. So you may need to know when you can retire an API, right? Uh, when you need to come up with, with the next version and so on, right? So like I said, uh, even product roadmap decisions are, are, are basically driven through observing uh, the insights uh, that, 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 that are running, uh, that, that you can get from the current APIs. So those are the series of steps we basically need to be doing in order to basically fill in that part of writing your software that generates greeting cards, right? So next we are going to be looking at, at a platform that we launched very recently called Corio. Um, it's, it's a, a cloud native engineering platform where we give the ability for developers to come in and develop and develop deploy and expose their APIs uh, while consuming other APIs as well. So it's a complete platform which takes the developers all the way from through from development to testing, to deployment, to exposure and observability and insights as well. So we'll go, go through a quick sample uh, of what it looks like to use Corio uh, as a developer, right? So I'm logged in into uh, Corio as a developer now. So this is basically the home page that you see. So as you all know, uh, <clears throat> any digital service, digital value that is offered today is built in the form of uh, one or more services, right? Microservices. So this is where developers can develop their services, right? And uh, this is the place, the API section is where you can expose those services uh, to consumers using API management and so on. And integrations is about uh, connecting different kinds of business systems for various kinds of automation tasks like system to system integration and so on. Uh, remote taps allows you to basically run your code uh, anywhere you want and basically connect to Corio to, to observe how they are behaving and so on. Observability is kind of straightforward. It basically is a section where you monitor your stuff. Insights again is a place where 
uh, it gives you all the business information or, or rather the data that, that, that could be useful in making business decisions and other uh, similar decisions, right? We also have plans in the pipeline, in the roadmap rather, uh, to enable some DevOps features and API marketplaces and so on. So <clears throat> let's get started by uh, going in uh, into the services section. So let's start by creating a very simple service which uh, gets data from, from a COVID API and uh, sends it as a, as a response. And while doing that, it updates, it connects to a Google Sheets API and uh, dumps some data into a Google Sheet as well. Right, so let's quickly get started. Uh, we'll go into this section called uh, create a service. Let's name this uh, COVID uh, stats country, we are going to be getting COVID stats uh, from, from, uh, from specific countries. So let's say create. <clears throat> so immediately once you do that, you'll be taken in, into the uh, development experience of, uh, of that service. So this is basically a REST service. So as you all know, we're developing a REST service. The first thing you have to do is to, you have to define the interface of your service, right? So let's call this uh, stats and we'll pass in the country as a path parameter. So the syntax for this uh, may sound a bit, uh, may look a bit unfamiliar. I'll, I'll explain to you why that is in a little bit, right? So we just say that's a get resource and say save. So as you can see here, uh, there's a quote panel that's opening up and I'll explain to you uh, that in a bit. So for now, let's just close it. So now you're taken into the low code development uh, experience of developing this API. So you may have heard about low code systems in various other contexts, such as developing React apps, developing Android apps, iOS apps, and so on. So this is a system where we give both a low code and a code way uh, of developing APIs, right? So, uh, so right now you are in the low code uh, mode of it. So let's look at quick what it looks like to program in low code. So let's say I want to put a quick log statement in here uh, just to identify that I've got a request, right? So I'm going to say uh, request received for country, put a plus sign and say country here. So country is a path parameter, if you remember, um, and say save. So that's how you put a log statement real quick. Right, and then let's uh, see. So, so similarly, there are uh, lots of stuff that you can do from uh, using these statements. Uh, so let's go into look at uh, what it uh, feels like or the experience about um, connecting to a third party API. So if you go into this API call section, you will see here a list of APIs that we can connect to directly from Corio itself. So this list is growing rapidly. So we have um, API connectors to different systems and if you I want to connect to any other API that's not listed in here. You can basically use what we call as the HTTP connector here. So as you, if you click on that, you can basically give your URL of your service and connect to it. So in this case, I have a connector for the API that I'm interested in using. So I can click on that. And as I click on that, as you can see here on the right-hand side, it brought up the documentation of that API. So, so as I mentioned, uh, when I was talking about this previously, uh, the documentation of the API is extremely important for the developer to be able to successfully program against it, right? So in this case, we want to get status, uh, COVID status by country. So this is the operation that we're interested in um, executing. So as you can see here, there's a get status by country function. It requires a country parameter, a mandatory country parameter. And the reason you are seeing question marks here is because um, the optional parameters. So these are the input that are required for this uh, particular operation. And to see what the response or the return type looks like, you can click on this and it will give you um, the, the shape of the response object that's coming out. So it has uh, a field called updated, a field called country, which has a country name and so on, right? So as you can see here, this operation seems to be returning or rather is promising to return a lot of uh, data. We obviously don't want all of these. We just want the number of cases and so on. So let's say continue to invoke the API and say uh, select the operation that we're interested in invoking, right? So the 
operation that we're interested in right now is country status. So let's just say that. And we have to pass in the uh, mandatory country parameter, which we are getting as a path parameter, right? And then, so that's that. The rest of the fields are uh, optional. So we really don't have to uh, worry about them now. Let's uh, give a nice name for the uh, response uh, variable. So let's call this country status and say save, right? So let's close this off. Now, uh, as you can see, it draws the, 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 the a sequence diagram here, uh, which gives you a representation of what your API is going to be doing, right? So uh, we now have a response from, from the COVID-19 endpoint. So as if you remember, it had a lot of data. Now we obviously don't need uh, all of that data. So let's create a simpler JSON out of this. So to do that, you can go um, into data mapping and say that you want to pick uh, this uh, response object that we got and you know pick only a few selected values out of it. So as I was mentioning previously, programming against this API also means dealing with the data that you get from that API, which is in most cases, JSON could be XML, could be whatever, right? So uh, the developers needs uh, systems where it makes it easier for them to program against these uh, APIs by doing things like data mapping. This is, which is exactly what we are doing right now. So I've, I've done, I'm uh, picking the input variable. The next is to pick the output variable. So let's say I want to call the output variable as country cases, because we are just interested in uh, the cases of a country. So let's say this is a JSON and say for now. Right, so I have a JSON template. So let's add the fields to the JSON. You can do that uh, by pressing this button here. So one of the fields we want is country name. So let's call it country name. <clears throat> and another field we want in our uh, data or JSON is uh, the total number of cases. So let's call this total cases, right? And then map the appropriate fields. So this, country field, we want it mapped into here. So this is an optional variable. Therefore, we are required to provide a default value. So let's say that. And then we want, we want to map the cases element from here into the total, case, uh, total cases here. So again, since it's an optional field, we have to give a default value. Let's give zero. And once that is done, we are basically done uh, doing the data mapping. So, right. So we now have a much uh, simpler uh, JSON called country cases, which we can use in our program. So now as I generate uh, this uh, program using low code, as you can see here, there's a source code that gets auto generated. So this is one of the unique uh, characteristics in this platform where the source code and the diagram are in complete fidelity. There is no intermediate interpretation of this. So the source code is the diagram and the diagram is the source code. What that allows is it allows developers to program in both in code and low code. So if you have been observing what I've been doing, you would have realized that, you know, low code is great for connecting to endpoints and so on, because it makes it much simpler to see uh, the data, the documentation and all of it, right? But if you are a programmer and you're familiar with declaring variables, uh, writing loops and so on, pressing buttons to do that is not really a great experience. You'd rather do it in code, right? So the benefit you get here is that incre it increases your productivity as a developer because you can now program uh, in both the code and the low code, right? So <clears throat> now my next step, as I mentioned, uh, when we were this, when I was describing this use case was, I want to dump some of this data into a Google sheet as, um, as someone is querying this data for analysis, right? So I want to dump the country name and the cases of the country into a Google sheet. So I want to create two variables to hold those data, right? So I can, I can program now in uh, code mode saying string uh, country name, and I want it from uh, country, cases dot uh, country name, right? So let's call this. So see, we have to do some error handling here. Uh, 
it's throwing some errors. I'm not sure why. And then let's save this and see if it goes away. I can do some random error. So uh, that's about one variable. So I also want uh, uh, the cases. So I'll call this, uh, I'll just call it cases. And again, we have to get from country cases dot total cases. And in this case, this is a decimal field. So it needs to be casted uh, to a string. So I can do that by wrapping it up like this and saying to string. Right, so that's basically uh, how I can program in, in, in uh, source code, right? So I'll quickly save this. So another interesting aspect that I want to demonstrate is uh, how it deals with security. So the COVID connector or the COVID API is a free API. You really don't need any keys to access it. But uh, the next thing that I'm going to do, which is about connecting to uh, Google Sheets uh, API requires security credentials, right? So let's see what that experience looks like. So I'm going to choose uh, the low code mode for it because it is much simpler uh, to connect to systems, uh, use, connect to other APIs using low code, right? So I'm going to say Google Sheets. And just as before the documentation shows up on the right, I'll close it off for now. I'll pick the account that I want to connect to so you can manually connect as well. Uh, and then say, um, continue uh, to invoke this API say what operation I want to append the row uh, and I have to give the sheet ID. So I'll just copy it quickly from here. I'll put in the sheet ID, the sheet name, call sheet one. And then I need to provide the row values. So I want the country uh, name as, uh, as the first column. So I'll say, add the item here and then I want the number of cases to be the second column uh, in the row so I'll say add the item here right and then I'll go ahead and say save. So one of the interesting things I want to show here is about so the developer as you can see as you saw here did not have to deal with, deal with any security stuff right so uh, this is again one of the very important aspects of programming with API security is critically uh, important and essential, right? So <clears throat> as you can see here, uh, to connect to this Google API, Google Sheets API, you need to be dealing with OAuth keys and so on. So none of that is hard coded in here. Uh, they, we have something called configurables, uh, which is basically a placeholder for these keys. And these keys are injected into uh, Kubernetes secrets upon deployment. And all of them are handled using best practices. And the developer does not have to know um, or be worried about uh, handling these things properly, right? So we've seen many instances where due to lack of knowledge or ignorance, developers tend to uh, inject keys and tokens into source code and configuration files and whatnot, right? And, and as a result of them, organizations having to face severe security breaches and troubles, right? So, um, and the reason for all of that because of is not following best practices or ma making mistakes in trying to do that. So. Uh, we try to abstract out all of that and make it super easy for the developer to do what he knows doing best and then leave the rest of the complicated stuff for the platform to handle right so that's about the the security handling part so we're almost done developing this service and finally we need to respond back to the client who's going to be calling it i can use the respond construct in here and say uh, respond back with the country uh, cases JSON and you can put a status code of 200 or you can just leave it empty and it will send a 200 anyway. So that's that. So we have successfully developed our service which connects to the COVID API, gets some data, dumps it into a Google Sheets and responds back to the client. Let's run this quickly from here and see uh, whether it's functioning, right? So <clears throat> now, as, as you can see, when I press the run button, it takes me to the test panel which is where I get to uh, test this API, uh, API out and see if, the, uh, if it's functioning as expected. So there's some compilation that goes, that's going on and you can see the logs in here. There's also uh, a tryout tool that's being loaded so that I can uh, try out the API fast. So uh, it's still booting up, let's give it, okay. If it is successful, let's uh, use this tryout tool to see if it is working. 
let me get the zoom window out of the way and see so try it out so this is the google sheet that we are going to populate so it already has data for usa and india let's try this out for sri lanka which is where i am from and so let's send this request and see if it responds <clears throat> All right, we have a response. So as you can see, we have a much simplified response coming in here in the form of JSON. There's 259,089 cases in Sri Lanka. And as you can see here, the sheet has been updated. So that's right, that's it. Uh, uh, code is functioning as expected. So, so this is basically about trying out the API. So I can stop this from here and then proceed to next steps. So we, it also allows you to implement unit tests uh, so that these uh, run every time you build the application. It also allows you to integrate this service with your Postman collections, Postman web account, so that you can link your Postman collections into here and, and run them uh, as integration tests for the API, right? So that's about the testing aspect of the API. And then finally, we go into the deployment aspect of the API. So once all your tests are done, you can basically go and deploy this API. And once you press the deploy button, which is not so let's just go ahead and press it, but we'll not, we are not going to wait until it finishes. So this is now going to trigger a deployment process, which basically includes running a full CI CD pipeline, which compiles your code, creates Docker containers, pushes it into registries, and finally, does a Kubernetes deployment. The reason we deploy in Kubernetes is, of course, because of all the benefits uh, it gives, including auto scaling, auto healing, uh, monitoring, tracing, and all of that, right? So uh that's about the deployment aspect of it so again another benefit here is that developers really don't need to be worried about the complexity of getting their deployments into production it's all handled by the platform itself uh, <clears throat> and once it is uh in, in production basically once it's running and uh, next you can go and see uh the 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 observability uh, data for your api so if you go into the observability section you should see some data so since uh, we don't have any, uh, we, we, we did not deploy this, let's go to something that is already deployed in here and go into the observability section, which should give us some uh, level of indication of, uh, of, of this API. So as you can see here, uh, it gives some data uh, on the diagram itself. So this is again a critically important aspect when you are programming modern applications that are dependent on third party APIs, right? So, uh, it's very important to know at a glance how your third party APIs are behaving as well that you're depending on. So this says that this uh, COVID API has 100% success rate, which is great, and has 700% response time, millisecond response times. Um, and then the Google Sheets endpoint has again 100% success rate and 342 millisecond response time. So these, these are critical impo important information for observing a modern application uh, effectively. And then on the right hand side, you have the regular uh, observability data, which uh, deals with, you know, uh, throughput and latency. Uh, and then you have logs uh, at the bottom of it here, where you can see the logs of your application. And we also have some diagnostics view, which gives you an indication of how much resources your API is consuming, right? Uh, what's the memory allocation uh, utilization, what's the CPU utilization like, and so on. So that's about that. Uh, and then finally, so we now have an API deployed in production. So to manage this uh, as an API uh, uh, is the next step. So once you have your API up and running, the next step is to manage this uh, as an API. So if you click on this button here, you'll be taken in into the API management view of this uh, respective API. So this is where you can uh, uh, you can basically attach documentation for the consumers of your API, uh, attach usage plans, manage the life cycle of your API and do all of that here. So you can see the, the, the overview of the API, the endpoint, the API key that it is protected with, you can attach a thumbnail to it, right? You can see the resources of it, you can attach documents to it, you can attach various kinds of meta information, right? Do various kinds of security configurations, uh, and then attach uh, usage plans, as you can see here, and do and then do lifecycle management uh, through this section. So, if you want to publish this API now uh, for developer portal for for users to be able to uh, see this on the developer portal, uh, you can go and publish it from here. 
So if I say publish, the API should now get published. And if I click on this, I'll be taken to the developer portal view of it. So the developer portal is a place consumers of this API will come in and see and learn how to use this API. <clears throat> so it signs me up, signs me in as, um, as a developer portal user, as a consumer. And uh, as soon as I'm logged in, I basically get to see the details of the API that are important to me as a consumer to now consume this API from an application. So, <clears throat> so you can see that it's loaded here. It gives me an overview of the API. It has a section for me to uh, generate credentials and uh, uh, use it in my application. I can try it out using a similar try tool that we saw before. I can read through the documentation, download SDKs and go through the contracts and so on. So this is basically the API management view of it. And once you have some uh, data, once you have consumers actually accessing it, similar to observability, uh, you can get the business side of observability through the analytics portal, right? So this portal is basically uh, a portal which gives you like an overall business overview of the API, how much traffic is coming in, how much latency, what kind of errors you have. So this one is not that great. Uh, this one has a 93% error, error rate, which is terrible. And there are different kinds of graphs here for, for traffic, for latency analysis, for to, to, to look at cash hits versus cash misses and so on, right? Uh, so there's a bunch of business information available here. And finally, I'll uh, come to the end of my presentation by quickly showing you uh, the uh, business integration side of things. So if you go into the home section here, and if you go into integration, so this is a section which has some pre-built scenarios for integrations. So this is for connecting different APIs from different systems to get certain automation tasks done, right? So in this case, this is a scenario which um, gets an issue su summary from J GitHub and sends it uh, in an email. So if you click on this, I, I can as a developer either use it as it is, or I can clone it, sorry, clone the uh, source code of it and use it, uh, edit it and use it for myself as well. So if you press on that, uh, now I can run this by providing this with the parameters uh, that are respective to my organization or my use case, right? So this is, uh, as I mentioned before, this is a GitHub issue to email use case where it picks up issues from my GitHub repo and sends an email to me, right? So I had to give the system what my GitHub account is, tell the system what my repository is and so on. I can feed it uh, in with my data and then uh, run this integration. Right, so that's about a high level overview of the platform. Uh, essentially, it is about a platform which allows developers to develop APIs by connecting to other web well-known APIs or any um, random API that is accessible uh, over HTTP or, or other protocols as well. Right, and it not just allows you to develop, but it also takes you through all the way from testing to deployment, uh, deployment into production, and exposing through API management with developer portals, which uh, which are provided out of the box with no coding at all, and then it gives you uh, observability and insights into your API system as well. So it's a full platform for programming APIs in the cloud. So. With that, I come to the end of my presentation. So I would like to thank uh, everybody uh, who joined in and I hope this was a useful session for you. Uh, if you do have any questions, please do get in touch. Uh, my Twitter handle goes as uh, Nuan Dias, N-U-W-A-N-D-I-A-S, uh, which is the same uh, as my LinkedIn handle as well. I'll be happy to uh, answer any questions you have and collaborate with you uh, with anything you want to talk about. Thank you so much and have a pleasant day.